Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. So before we get started, we always want to remind you what is in our description and show notes every week. You can always find links to our social media if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You will also find links to some... Let's say you just bought a house. Bad news is, you're one step closer to becoming your parents. You'll proudly mow the lawn. Ask if anybody noticed you mowed the lawn. Tell people to stay off the lawn. Compare it to your neighbor's lawn. And complain about having to mow the lawn again. Good news is, it's easy to bundle home and auto through Progressive and save on your car insurance. Which, of course, will go right into the lawn. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company affiliates and other insurers. Discount not available in all stages or situations. The resources that we use to research the episodes. So if you want to do further reading after listening, then you can check out those links in our show notes. There will also be links to our Patreon and Threadless. So if you want some bonus episodes and small merch items, check out our Patreon. And if you want some t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, stuff like that, you can check out our Threadless. And the last thing we'll have is links to resources for things like 12-step programs and mental health resources, domestic violence resources, stuff like that. So with all that said, I think we can get to today's story. Let's do this. Let's do the damn thing. It's a wild one. <laughs> We're talking about Kelly Cochran today. Is that another story of an adulterous woman? Yes, it is. That's weird. <laughs> Yet another one. So we're still on letter A, and this is another adultery story for letter A. And I realized myself, I'm like, this is pretty female heavy. But I was like, I don't really give a shit. Because there will be other topics that are just going to be like men. Yeah, well, we've talked about them. so many dudes. That too. Yeah. So I don't really care. It's time for women to shine it on Murder is, Dictionary. isn't it? <laughs> I agree. So yeah, so we've got a few now in a row of female killers. Some good ones. Not to spoil it. Is that a spoiler? No. No, we this know. This is the third. They'll see by the episode title, title that it's a woman, you know. Yes. But... Yeah, so Kelly Cochran, and there's an awesome show about it called Dead North that we watch, so. It's on ID, Investigation Discovery. It's also on the ID Go app. Wow, you've got all the info. I've got all the, the apps. The ID Go app. But you have to have a cable provider to log into that shit, and it's stupid. <laughs> and Terrarium TV was recently stopped that was devastating. That's so how I'm we still, got all our shit. It's before. true. I'm still working on, and when I find it, of course, I'll let everyone know. Don't worry. When I find something comparable, yeah, well, I'll let you know. <laughs> but right Amazon now, Prime though, some good stuff that you haven't seen in a long time. I watched The Burbs the other night. Oh, nice. And The Great Outdoors is probably happening soon. <laughs> all this fun stuff. So yeah, Dead North was really good. Highly Sorry, recommended. Sorry, that's right. <laughs> about that four parts yeah that was a good one so you know not all but some of the information that we got is from that show and i kept forgetting the name so i'm glad i didn't fuck it up i was half expecting to look over at you and you'd be like uh no it's not that i thought it would be something about like mariners dead north and right i don't know it was good i'm like compasses and it just it still to me doesn't I guess the, where it happened is north. Yeah, it's still it doesn't like, convey. It I thought do it would be like that. I don't know, murder north or something. Anything. Crime, crime in the north. Something. something. Moving so, on. but there's enough to talk about, and there's a lot of footage of the actual people involved. Great and, footage. Yeah, so definitely highly recommend that. But we'll go through like the main points of the story today, so you'll get all the info anyway. So, first of all, Kelly Gaboyan met Jason Cochran when they were only kids because they actually grew up living next door to each other. They were neighbors. Adorable. Right? It's kind of cute if it didn't turn into a murder story. This is true. <laughs> so, Kelly was super outgoing. She was really fun and friendly. She was one of those, like, free-spirited girls, very spontaneous, and people really liked her. She wasn't really shy. She made really a lot of friends easily and maybe wasn't super popular, but definitely had a lot of friends. Everyone knew who she was. Yeah. 
Jason, on the other hand, of course, opposites attract. He was more of an introverted person. He was quieter than Kelly, but he was really sweet by all accounts. And everybody said he had a good sense of humor and he was really kind. He was just quiet. I would guess that you're right. He did find it attractive that she was loud, Mm -hmm. you know, just more boisterous than him. Right. And she probably found it attractive that he was a little bit more calm. And well, maybe... she probably loved it that he would just listen to her talk. Right. <laughs> There's that. Totally. I bet she loved it. <laughs> so Jason was a few years older than Kelly. And as the kids got older, he developed kind of a crush on her. And Kelly was a really difficult teenager. She was really headstrong. She ran away a bunch of times. She was just one of those girls that kind of got into trouble. Angsty teen girl. Mm Mm-hmm. Been there. We've all been there. Right? (laughs) I get it. So she was kind of out of control to the point where her family actually sent her away to a girl's home. And then when she came home, she just turned over another leaf. A lot of times it doesn't make a huge difference. But for her, she seemed to completely change by all accounts. It seems real, too. Yeah, it was very genuine. Yeah. So in high school, Jason finally asked Kelly out. He just kind of built up the guts and she was this new person. And he was like, I'm going to take a chance. Oh, Jason. Right? Like, that's awesome. So she totally went for it, gave him a chance and fell for him really quickly. And the relationship got pretty serious after they graduated. She said that Jason was the love of her life and that they, quote, finished each other's sentences. Doesn't sound like Jason said much. Right? Like (laughs) Might not have been that hard. He just filled in the, like, you know, period. That was it. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) So the the couple quickly moved in together in 2001, and then Jason proposed to her on her birthday. Kelly said, I, of course, said yes. I thought we'd live happily ever after. So she thought this was like her fairy tale. They were high school sweethearts. This was going to be... That Disney princess kind of thing. It is weird to me that they're like high school sweethearts. They get together. They stay together. They get married because she just, from all accounts, even when they're young, doesn't seem like, she seems like someone who'd want to date around. Yeah. It doesn't seem like a one woman man, one man woman. Right. At all. Yes. Doesn't come across that way. Even later, especially. Yeah. I don't know when this change that she went from like, I am with you only. You are the only person I want to ride forever. Right. Love of my life. I don't get that. It doesn't seem part of her nature at all. She wants every dick she can find. Everyone. So where did that come from? She wants to play. Was it always there? Right. No, I think so. I think she was kind of like squishing it down a little bit. Like there were. This is why I wonder about she comes back from the girl's home and is just fine now. Yeah. No, I don't know. It seemed to be genuine at the time, but. I don't know. I question whether it was just the pressure that got to her that made her change or if she really felt that way. Yes. Yeah. So either way, no matter what her motivation was, they got married in 2002. And Kelly at the time said that she believed they were soulmates. Later, Kelly would say that her and Jason made a pact on their wedding night that if one of them was unfaithful, then they'd have to kill their lover. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> You're like, you don't good. even have anything to say. Good. Yeah, just keep just going. Just crazy. Just keep going. Yeah. Kelly would also sometimes claim that she kind of thought it was a joke when she agreed to it, which I don't buy. And although it was something that they talked about, she claims that she really didn't take the pact seriously. I have a really hard time with this. Every time I've heard or read this, I just kind of laugh. Because I just don't believe it. Yes. I never have, and I really don't think I will. And for some reason, this is the thing in this case that I'm like, oh, that's ridiculous. This is the one This is point it, where especially you're like, no. here, right? But <laughs> this to me is bullshit, and this girl's a liar from start to finish. So yes. I just, I don't know, but it's a great story. <laughs> Agreed. Like, I think she's definitely such a liar that... It just calls into question everything she says. And this from the jump is like, it doesn't make sense to me. Why bring it up? When you hear... If you didn't take it seriously. When you see Jason, 
mm-hmm. and everything too. You're like, this guy's not talking about that. He's not that. He's not like. He's not. I gotta fuck shit right. up for you, bitch. Like now, look, huh? Like it's crazy mm. and all aggro and like sign this pact, <laughs> right? Like, Ride or die. This guy's like whatever you think, honey. Yeah. And you see it later a lot. Yeah. And I try not to get too hung up on people's appearances, but let's just be realistic. Like, Jason looks very kind of... um... (laughs) Butterbean. With glasses on. That is perfect. I had not thought of that. it just came to me. Yes. But But he looks like a nerd, like if Butterbean did uh, worked IT. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And honestly, that to me is like secondary. He's just, his personality is just not but the guy that forces you on your like honeymoon night or some shit to sign a pact. Right. Like that, but that's night. like when you see him, yes. he looks like you can see his entire personality. Yes. That's what I think. Yeah. Is it's not so much about his looks. It's just about, I can see how passive he is just by seeing a picture of him. I don't think he keeps a lot of secrets. And that's probably one of the things that she likes because you you can read him all over his face. Yes. And she has secrets. Yes. So maybe that's another thing. It's like opposites attract for real here. Yeah. He's just an open book. You get what you see. That's it. Yeah. So they're totally opposites in every way. But, you know, after the honeymoon, Kelly claims that Jason became a different person. That's contrary to what you and I are seeing. Bullshit. Yeah. So she called him a monster and said he was basically like two different people in one body. Kelly says, quote, I loved one and was scared of the other. Over the next decade, Kelly claims that the relationship basically deteriorated into verbal abuse and physical threats, and he was just terrorizing her, which, like we said, is contrary to everything else we seem to know about him. Very contrary. She says that Jason told her he would kill her if she ever tried to divorce him. Kelly also recalls that on numerous occasions that he put a gun to her head and threatened to kill her and then kill himself. I don't buy that one either. I know. When, like, when you see her later and how aggressive and stuff she is. Yes. And then again, you think about this little Jason, like not little, but in my mental, like I'm seeing their personalities. Mm-hmm. He's little to her big. And I, I don't know. Yes. And we don't know. They had a long term relationship. Sometimes, like, the control shifts and that stuff. But, like, I don't believe that. I don't at all. I'm on and the I same page. And I feel bad saying it, but I don't. And then this this bitch is a liar. Right. Straight up. So. Well, that's the thing yeah. is, like, you know, so much of the time, just such a high percentage of time, I believe the women. And I believe that we need to listen to women. Yep. However... The reason that we don't listen to women sometimes is that the bad apple spoils the bunch. It seems like Kelly is that person that is the bad apple that now people can use it as an example. Like, oh, women lie. And it's like, no, not women lie. One woman fucking lied. Shut up. You know, but this is that woman that I think would be the type of personality that would make up claims of abuse. I agree. And I wouldn't I hesitate to say that about anyone but Kelly Cochran, if you see her, she's that person that it could be made up. She looks more like she abuses the shit out of him, to be honest. I agree. Five minutes of trial testimony kind of tells the story with her. Yes, yes. Highly recommend you look at footage. Even interrogation. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of tells the story. Yeah. She's a bully. She's a terrorizer. That's yeah. what I see. Yeah. So I wouldn't call into question in most cases, but this one, I don't know. I just don't believe her. So she also claimed that he even shot at her one time because he was an excellent shot. She knew that he only missed because he basically wanted to, that he meant to miss. It's just there's so much that I just don't believe. (laughs) Yeah, that one's hard. So acquaintances basically confirmed Kelly's story and said that he was abusive and controlling with her. However, nobody actually saw this firsthand. They only heard the evidence of violence through Kelly. It's interesting to me because they they only know what she's told them exactly. because they're acquaintances. So they don't really know these people very long, probably. And like they're only knowing what she's telling them. So, of course, they're going to believe her. Yes. They don't know any different. 
They no. don't see the other side at all. Absolutely not. And they, it seems like these people are not really seeing the two of them together very much. Yeah. It's just seeing Kelly coming in kind of worked up and spinning this web of stories about how he made her that way. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, Jason could have been like a mentally controlling like psycho in that sense. Like you're into this, but Kelly repeatedly doesn't do what he wants her to do. Right. So, I mean. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't to me. No. Because it's just noise at that point. Because she's doing what the fuck she wants to do. Every time. She's just irritated that someone's going to try to stop her. Yeah, I think kind she's of how it sounds. more bratty than anything. Yes. Just wants to get her way and complains about that. About I having agree. someone tell her no. You know? But of course, Jason's friends claim that it was actually the opposite. And Kelly was the one who was domineering and controlling. So his friends say that Kelly had anger issues and would be rageful and abusive towards Jason. Jason's parents recall that it was always about Kelly and that she had to constantly be the center of attention, which makes a lot of sense. This family's known her forever because they were next door neighbors when they were growing up. Exactly. Yeah. They're probably a really good source for some of this information. Yeah, I tend to believe them. Yeah. Even though they're related to him, I do think they had a handle on what her personality type was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people close to Jason say that Kelly was charming, but also manipulative, sadistic, and calculating. If you say those words about someone, no good shit is going to happen, right? Those are big words. Big words. So we all know what kind of person she is. We're painting a picture here, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, of course, it's important to point out that false reports of abuse are extremely rare and often abuse goes underreported. But when it comes to this case, all we have is Kelly's account of the abuse. And based on her other behavior, it's entirely possible that Kelly was lying. It also seems likely that Jason may have been abused by Kelly and wasn't reporting it based on how they both behaved and what other people said. This is, you hear that a lot when you're talking through, they just repeatedly say like, no, it's not the way that she put it. And he was definitely abused, like verbally for sure. For sure. For sure. And, you know, the story's like, oh, he put a gun to my head and just clicked it. It's like, that sounds like something Kelly would do. Absolutely. Doesn't sound like something Jason would do. No. Because it sounds to me like if he's a good shot, he's got some gun training behind him. And they know you don't put your finger on the trigger. Right. Ever. Right? And she's just Russian rouletteing in the house. Yeah. I'm just (laughs) saying. Like. Yeah. I don't know. It just so much of it doesn't add up. And all, again, all we have is her word. That's, and that's all true. that can speak for him is the footage that we see of the two of them separate and together. Yes. Right? So that's all we can judge off of. So it's really unclear exactly what happened. But it is certain that the relationship was pretty volatile and violent. No matter which direction it was coming from. And at some point, Jason was injured at work and also had a battle with cancer, although I didn't really find specifics about it. Yeah. Yeah. It was very weird. And he was left pretty, you know, he was messed up. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah, I, so I don't he was know out of a job, but there really wasn't information about what happened. I felt like it, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I don't even want to speculate. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. But he lost his job and had a lot of physical limitations. But Kelly said that even though the physical abuse slowed down, the emotional abuse escalated when he was physically down. Kelly says that when he lost his job, Jason's jealousy got worse and she started having affairs with other men. I think I know why his jealousy got worse. (laughs) Oh, yeah? She's having affairs with other men. (laughs) Is that it? I just, you know, this is where this part of the story, too, kind of, like, crumbles for me. Yeah. Because what the fuck, bitch? Mm -hmm. Like, he's got cancer. Just, I can't stand her at this part. when he And then she blames him later for all kinds of things that happen due to these physical limitations. Right. This, again, tells me that, like, she is a problem here. Mm -hmm. She has no empathy. For what he's going through. None. Absolutely. 
So in January 2015, the couple moved from Indiana to the remote Upper Peninsula of Michigan with basically no notice to any of their friends and family. They just picked up and moved. And it was highly unusual for people to move to that area in the middle of their awful winter. It seemed really strange, the timing and the quickness. There's definitely something here. Yes. Neither one of them has like a job opportunity. Nope. He is either still going through or has just finished cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. And she's not like cracking the atom. So <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I mean, really? So yeah. it's very interesting because, yeah, a January, a Michigan. I mean, that's like waist high snow mm-hmm. blizzards on the regular. So it makes no fucking sense. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah, looking back, it seems clear to people that they must have gotten in some sort of trouble and they just needed to get out of town really quickly. That's where they should really start looking. Yeah, they should have started at that point. Start with some missing persons Mm -hmm. reports, maybe. Because something hinky was going on at that point. Definitely. So after they moved, Kelly got a job at the Oldenburg Group, who manufactured mining and defense equipment. She was very talkative with her coworkers, so she made friends quickly, and she, of course, soon began having affairs with both Eric Erickson and Chris Regan. And remember, she started having these affairs because Jason's jealousy went through the roof. He's so jealous, I just gotta go play the field of dick. But why is he jealous? It's logic, Kelly. It's logic. Her stories are just terrible. Some of them are great, but most of them are just so easy. Yeah. Easy to pick apart for sure. So at work, Kelly met 51-year-old Chris Regan because their workstations were actually right next to each other. So they talked often throughout the day and they kind of became friends. Over time, they became friends, of course, outside of work. And then eventually they began sleeping together. She was his work wife. Yes. That's what it sounds like. Chris Regan was divorced with two adult children, and he'd recently been through a breakup with his longtime girlfriend, Terry O'Donnell. Friends say that Chris was really outgoing. He was happy, loving, and kind. He'd actually been in the Air Force, and he was really active and outdoorsy. And he was often out hiking, sailing, kayaking. There's a ton of footage of him just kind of on boats and having fun outdoors. He really sounds like the opposite of Jason. Absolutely. Yes. Jason is a video gamer. Mm hmm. And here comes this guy that's just like, yeah, I want to let's go on a hike. Let's go on a picnic, you know? Mm -hmm. And she's like, yes, please. I'm hoping it's all during like spring and summer because it's cold as fuck (laughs) up there. Let's go on a winter hike. Oh my God. (laughs) So Chris had recently actually accepted a job in North Carolina. And he was in the middle of finalizing his new hire paperwork and packing up in October 2015. After years of not being close, Chris was also reconnecting with his son, Chris Jr. And they'd become really close enough so that Chris Jr. was actually planning to move to North Carolina with him. Chris Jr. says that he was all packed up and he basically just had a mattress and his laptop unpacked while he was waiting for the final moving day. He was ready to go. Yeah. October 14th, 2015 rolled around and Kelly told Chris that her husband Jason had went out with friends and asked him to come over. So she, of course, is inviting him over, probably knowing this is one of the last times she's going to see him. Right? He's just ready to go. She knows. Yeah. So when he arrives thinking Jason's gone, he came through the back door and Kelly says they basically began having sex in the doorway. This is another one I don't buy. Yeah. You see her literally acting it out where she's like, oh, and it was like, and I'm like, no, that's not. It's not. It's not like it's this. When you see it, too, it's, it's the most not organic way for like two people to perform Start a sex fucking. act <laughs> like especially if they've known each other at least 10 months they've been together right they i just don't see it at all no it's not sex like that anymore yeah if it she ever just even like happened points at the wall and she's like oh yeah we just had sex right here and yeah. it's like no and everyone no. just kind of you know oh okay kelly sure and then they let her try to show it and it's just like 
you guys are assholes because she looks stupid as fuck right, right? now. Right, <laughs> you're just letting and her you're play just herself. letting her talk bullshit. So then, of course, suddenly, Jason was actually home and he shot Chris in the back of the head. So, of course, we only know these accounts through Kelly, but Chris's body either fell or was dragged downstairs to the basement. We really don't know too much of the interaction. Like, all we know is that she said they were having sex. Jason shot him. This part is really vague. Very vague. It's kind of weird. It's just important to point that out. Yeah. You know? No, for sure. Because it really isn't that clear. And, like, why is Jason there? It, like her story about why he's there doesn't even make sense either. And yeah. then why would Chris be there? Oh, he's and Jason's so psychotically jealous and like all this is their last time to meet. They're gonna fuck in the hallway. There's all these things going on, and then he just shows up and she's like, Oh, surprise, he shoots him in the head. None of it matches. She's a liar. Right. There Absolutely. It is. Absolutely. So she, of course, is trying to paint him as the monster in this whole situation. That's the thing that I gather from it. You know? Oh, yeah. Jason is not going to get a good edit. No. From here on out. No. So she says Jason told Kelly to bring him an extension cord so he could use a handsaw to basically take Chris's body apart. Jason handed Kelly a pair of forceps and told Kelly that she needed to remove the bullet from Chris's head. He's got quite a workshop down there, by the way. Yeah, like he's all prepped for this. I just... I don't have forceps. I don't understand. Do you? No, it's not part of my toolkit. I know my mom does, but she's like an extra kind of preparedness. She's a Girl Scout leader, oh, so it's extra. That makes sense. But I I mean... The average person grandmas, is not going to have forceps unless I don't, they go out to get them. Okay, let's put it this way. Kelly and Jason probably don't have forceps. No. But they do. Maybe he's, you know, doing stuff down. Maybe he's a taxidermist part time. Oh, just, you know, in his spare time. People have hobbies. When he's not playing video games. No, he's not a force of guy. He's a gamer. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's not work. I'm trying to rationalize it. Like maybe he just, you know, stuffs animals in his part time. No. no. he's a gamer. That's the thing is they must have gotten these just for this specific use, right? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. So Kelly says that she was hesitant to do this and she basically just gently held the forceps near the wound and pretended to try and retrieve the bullet because she was scared of Jason. So when she gave up, Jason asked her to make him a burger and fries. When Kelly cooked him dinner, Jason continued dismembering Chris's body in the basement. I feel like she tried to set it up like that. Like, oh, he's so cold and calculated that he got hungry while doing this. I feel like this is just on purpose, her saying that he asked for dinner. I know how it went. It went like this. Hey, Jason, do you want me to make you a burger and fries? Right. (laughs) While you dismember this guy because I don't want to do it. And even part of me believes that it was more along the lines of just, hey, Jason, I'm going to cut this body apart. I'm hungry. I want a burger. You I've want worked up too. quite an appetite. That's it. Yeah. I I just, I don't believe a word she says. No. And I think she's way more involved and way more into it, like actually into it than she lets on. Definitely. After removing his arm, Jason took one of Chris's hands and basically waved it at Kelly, saying that it would be the last time that Chris would wave goodbye to her. I don't want to believe this is true, but I also sort of want to believe this is true because it's so ridiculous that it's like, yes, not funny, but okay. Yeah. Like, oh, I see what you did there. Visual. Trying to make some jokes. Okay, Kelly. Very well done. Right. But this is, again, not a Jason production. Not at all his personality type. It just doesn't add up. The neighbors say that they heard gunshots and screaming coming from the direction of the Cochran's house. I don't know who's screaming, but the neighbors heard it. So somebody is screaming. I don't know if it's a situation where there was more of a struggle than was let on or if the two of them were fighting throughout this whole thing. I would bet it's the after fight, after effect, you shot this guy. What the fuck do I do? What the fuck do we do now? Yeah. That's probably the screaming. Probably. When the noise subsided, they thought nothing of it, basically, which is weird. 
But over the next couple days, they heard the sound of saws, drills, hammers, all sorts of construction stuff. And it was happening at odd hours. Everyone pointed it out that it was like, why would they be doing that in the middle of the night? But of course, they didn't assume the worst. They just thought that the Cochrans were basically doing remodels in their new house on off hours when they weren't working. I could absolutely rationalize away <laughs> loud people you guys Near can't you? see it but courtney's pointing upstairs to the neighbors that are constantly somehow moving chains like well, i don't even know what they're I doing i believe that they're building extra rooms and putting up walls and stuff like this but it's it never stops that's the thing that's no. interesting we, it, we are here all different weird hours and they are always going we've had like sort of change how we do things just to record this right because they will just drop 45 pound bowling balls from up high it's right above where we are weirdest thing that's all i could think they're doing right for a while i was like oh they're growing weed i hear these machines at certain hours mm-hmm. oh i hear weird fucking saws i hear some rah, 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 rah. real <laughs> life saws <laughs> And I know the noises, hammers, <laughs> drills. I mean, what the fuck are you doing? So, yeah, I totally get these neighbors that are like, it's fucking 4 a.m. Right. And this son of a bitch just got home. And now he's got a project. And they move their table every day. <laughs> every day. It's a dining Where room is table. it going? <laughs> I don't know. Our layout's the same. I can't figure it out. It's been years. Yeah, like when I first hear this kind of stuff, I'm just like, wait, you didn't think anything of this? That's fucked up. Report I've always... this. But then oh, when yeah, I'm here, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, hey, this shit happens. You know, like there's construction. You just kind of deal with it. You grumble, turn over and go back to sleep. Right? I don't know. The first thing I thought was um, fucking say something. Screaming and saws. That's not good. Call 911. Maybe it's time. You know? But then... Yeah. Being here and recording and being like, hey, there's chains upstairs. It is like a ghost. I I think you wear cement shoes. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I can understand how it happens. But again, it's like if you see something, say something. If you hear something, say something. People comment on it all the time. What the hell is going on up there? It's crazy. I have no answer for you. Yep. I get the just baffled face. But I think, you know, if it progressed, basically, like, the following days, the neighbors say that there were several fires that Jason and Kelly had and that the yard smelled awful. Like, if you saw that, you'd be like, yeah, um, cops. What now. a terrible place to live for, like, two weeks, right? Just <laughs> Where you're just, everything's normal. And then they've got garbage fires. Yeah. Chains. And yelling. You know, all this shit is going on. And it I mean, smells awful. Like, come on. And they're just waving. Good morning, neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> I just hey, don't Jason. want to piss that guy off, right? Yeah. I don't want my house to burn to the ground. Yeah. The smell was so terrible that the entire neighborhood stunk. And a neighbor even asked him what he was burning. It was that bad. So again, if you've got all these signs, that's when you say something. It's one thing to have the noise, but everything, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. I would, I too would probably just be like, if we're that close of neighbors that I'm hearing this, you know, construction, I want to see this tile work you're doing. Right? Just like, hey, let me see that update. I would love to see it. And where'd you purchase it? We're thinking it? about renovating too. I'm why totally don't, thinking about getting, getting backsplash in my bathroom. Right? What colors did you get? What brand is that? Just do some investigating. Did you buy these online? Did you pick them up in store? <laughs> I got questions. I could just make this shit up all day. <laughs> Jason didn't have good answers, though. He said, no, he, didn't, he's he? like, basically, we're clearing brush and we're burning it. I'm but, burning the same thing you are. Like, brush. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense because the neighbors insist the way that it smelled, there was just no way it was plants. Well, it doesn't even make sense to say sweet that. Sweet and savory. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> just come up with a better lie, you know? They're both know. terrible. They're He's been terrible. listening to her and it's like his skills just went out the window years ago. Right? We do know, even though they were lying about all these things, the facts that we do know is that Jason actually put Chris's body parts in trash bags and then he asked Kelly to help him carry them. Kelly, again, from her account, says that she refused and she told Jason that she wouldn't help him basically treat Chris like garbage. She has morals. 
I this mean, is her point where she's like, nope. This is the point. <laughs> this is it. Kelly says she only helped him because he was planning on using acid to dissolve the body. And she was upset that if Jason used acid, then basically Chris's body would never be found. So she's like paints it out to be this sort of kindness. I don't know if I buy this either. That Not at Jason all. Jason is some chemist. And OK, I know you really don't have to be like a chemist to make this shit, you know, happen. But I just don't see he can barely like he's physically in, uh, handicapped in a lot of ways. And so she's helping him mm-hmm. if that's what's going on. Because he can, how is he carrying two, ga- two gallons in each hand of like muriatic acid, some chlorine? Like what is going on? I don't fucking get it. Nope. So this is another one where I'm just like, it's a nice story. Yeah. That she's trying to play on the emotions as soon as she can, you know? It's well, a I cared about him so story much. only to her. Yeah. And that's what you have to look at every time. It's fucking insulting. Yes. Yeah. To, like, anyone who really cares about this guy. And the worst part is, like, she afterwards suggests that they go to Crystal Falls Trail. Like, she's already got in mind. She admits that she chose the place to actually take the body parts. So you don't want to treat him like garbage, but then you're going to go on to actually choose the place that he goes. She's not good at remembering her life. No. And, like, keeping it together is a linear form. Mm. She just pulls him out of the fucking air. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. She says she thought that Crystal Falls trails were like this high traffic area and Chris's remains would be more likely to be discovered, basically. I don't know. It's just she seems like she's trying to do it for his family and blah, blah, blah. But you still participated in his murder. Every time I've ever heard someone say, like, oh, because I wanted them to be found sooner. I question that every fucking time. Yeah. Because... I have a hard time believing that. I know. Me too. Okay. It like, doesn't, <laughs> no, it doesn't make sense. I totally agree. It's just, it's a way, again, to relieve yourself of this wrongdoing. Like, I murdered them, but it wasn't that bad because I had this last bit of kindness to their family or whoever. I did this, but I didn't mean to do this. Right. I didn't have hate in my heart when I did this. They drove out to Crystal Falls, Michigan, and they hid Chris's remains near this remote wooded trail, like she suggested. When they returned home, they invited their neighbors, the Sailor family, over. The Cochran's neighbors, the Sailors, say that it was only a few weeks prior that they had begun hanging out with Kelly and Jason. They were pretty new friends. The way they describe it They would just kind of sit out in the yard. They would chit chat. They would smoke weed, just chill together. But a few days after the murder, Kelly and Jason invited them over for a barbecue, which first off was just a little bit odd because they hadn't really had meals together. And David Saylor thought it was strange that even though the Cochran's were usually pretty broke, all of a sudden they had a couple hundred dollars worth of meat. And I love that this guy noticed that, by the way. He's like, these motherfuckers got a lot of meat around here. Yes. Like, I know that's, that's a at lot least of money. like $127 in filet, this and that, blah, 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 right? And I know they don't have a lot of and money. And I know they can't afford that. What the fuck is going on? It was just so unusual that David Saylor asked Jason about it. And of course, Jason, again, made up a lie and said that he was a butcher that dealt in exotic meat. So he basically just got a bunch of stuff from work. Which, if you're his neighbor, you know he's not leaving his house every day. You see him. His car is always there. You know that that's not true. They're just making up these lies. So as David Saylor describes it, the meat that they ate was semi-transparent and had this firm texture of basically like lobster or shrimp. This was the part where I... I paused it and I went, oh my God. Yeah. What? Like rewound it and was just like, he said fucking lobster. Are you serious? And all like, I just have these visuals of just like people ripping them apart and it's gross. Yeah. And you have to share it with me because I can't do this alone. (laughs) 
And David Saylor is just the, like, you just want to cry for him because he I looks know. broken. He really does. You see it. This has taken a toll on him. He seems like a changed man. And at first you're kind of like, ha ha, these motherfucking guys hanging out on the porch. But you're like, this is really damaged it's this guy. It's very sad. Would me, but you see it on him. Yeah. And it's really, it's kind of upsetting. Looking back, the neighbors are fairly certain that they ate parts of Chris's body. Oh. And David Saylor says that now he doesn't trust anybody, which I totally get that someone, I mean, fed I, you human I meat. I get it. I don't blame him. Not at all. He'll never, ever trust anyone to prepare food, buy anything for him, grocery store. He's not ordering. He's not ordering He's takeout. Vegan. He's yeah, vegan. He's the only sure. vegan in like the Upper Peninsula right? or whatever the fuck they are now. Oh, poor David. Yeah, it's really sad. So he just not only has trust issues, he basically has trouble eating. You can see he looks a little bit gray and malnourished. He looks gaunt in the face. Yeah, he's lost a ton of weight. You would immediately be like, oh, he's, he's on meth. But no. no, he doesn't even seem, he just... He, he's very he's not slow eating the same anymore. And sad and quiet. Very. He's but affected. He looks like a meth head. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. He, he doesn't looks look skeletal. Nourished. Yeah. I just I feel so bad for the sailors. And it and it's like can, again, it's like additional victims, basically. Like it wasn't just enough for you to murder someone. You had to bring other people into it. And fuck up okay. their lives like okay. this. Okay, whose idea was that? Barbecue. Yeah, One, I know. Two, she is, we never hear that she's at the barbecue. Mm -hmm. It's like Jason's. It's certain, about Jason. So, you know, maybe Jason's way more fucking twisted than we thought, but Jason does what he's told. Yes. So we've got all this meat, like you've got his arms and legs in bags now out at Crystal Falls, but we've still got this torso. Is that the kind of the way I thought about it? Because I'm like, why the fuck this little one's meat? Yeah. He's in bags, but they probably do. Yeah. Who the fuck? Oh, we should give it to the neighbors. You think it was a funny joke? Right. Went wrong? This was the only point where I was like, oh, maybe Jason is more fucked up than yeah. we really think. This is the only thing where I'm like, ooh, I don't know. Yeah, this really is the only thing that it's, you know. But you are ooh, right. I mean, here. you do bring up a good point. It's just like he did everything she said. Yeah, there's By not a lot all of deviation. Accounts, she was the bully. She was the abuser, it seems. So if he was that scared of her or if she was the one that maybe actually shot him maybe jason was more afraid of her after that point we don't really know That's but this was the only thing that too. seems to kind of yeah. be i don't know kind of hard to interpret and figure out what actually was the motivating things going on behind jason's thoughts you know hmm. this is something that sticks out to me for sure yeah and it it stands out even further because about a week after the murder jason checked himself into a psychiatric hospital so we know he was pretty deeply affected by it. He was suicidal, and he stayed in the hospital for like five days. Yeah. That feels like something you just can't get past. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And Kelly's not in the hospital. Nope. She's Kelly's just fine. going on with life. So I don't know. It's just hard to interpret what was going on at this time. And there's just things that conflict. Yeah. He's the one barbecuing, but then he ends up in the psychiatric hospital yeah. I don't know how to what to make of those things. So, I don't know. So, now that Chris has been missing for a little while, his recent ex-girlfriend, Terry O'Donnell, became concerned that she couldn't reach him. And it had basically been two weeks at this point. So, he was supposed to travel to North Carolina to complete the new hire paperwork for his job and do the drug test and do the whole stuff to onboard with this company. But he never showed up. So Terry went to the police on October 27th, 2014, and she filed a missing persons report with the chief, Laura Frizzo. Terry O'Donnell is like the best friend we all need to have. Yes. This woman was, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong. I talked to him. He's got a new job. He didn't this. He didn't that. He is not that person. Run off. Drug habit. Different chick, whatever the fuck it would be. I know he's my ex, but we're still cool. Yeah. Something's wrong. Yeah. Would not, would not go away. No. 
She would not let up. And he had she's just, that advocate everyone needs. He had just gotten back kind of with a relationship with his son, too. Mm-hmm. And she says that, like, that meant more than anything to him because they'd been estranged. Mm-hmm. And that's huge, just that alone. And his yeah. kid was going to live with them and all that, too. Yes. We all need a Terry. Right. We and all I do. And I really, I was, like, talking to the TV. Yes. Fucking, She's like, yes. get it, Terry. Terry. <laughs> like, she is really one of the, like, shining stars here for me. Absolutely. Totally, totally agree. She would not let it go. She basically took uh, the police to Chris's home. She let them in with their keys and they had to look around. And it was all because of Terry that this whole investigation got kicked off. He could have been probably missing for a while because he was going to move. Right. So, oh, maybe he's taking longer to get there than we thought. Maybe he's taking a long trip. Or the job started sooner or Anything Maybe they didn't take him. Maybe could have changed gone his mind. Unnoticed without Terry. So long. Yeah. And she was so like into finding him that she actually said she had seen his car at the local like park and ride, basically. And she took the police to the car. I mean, she had all this information. She walked in ready to start the investigation. She did a lot of um, investigating for them in the beginning. Yes. So when they examined the car, there was really no evidence of a struggle. But there was his knee brace found inside, and he had recently had knee surgery. So, of course, it seemed really weird that he would just, like, leave his knee brace there, you know? Love Terry for knowing that. Right. That's a good friend. Absolutely. And knows exactly what's going on with him. But in the car, one of the things that they did find was a post-it that had Kelly Cochran's address on it. Bad sign. So police, of course, tracked his last credit card purchase, and it was two weeks prior, and it was at a gas station. So they checked out the surveillance footage, and it showed that Chris was alone and filling up, and then he just left without anything suspicious, and that was the last time there was any sign of Chris. It was also clear that there was nobody following him when he left the gas station, so they kind of ruled that out. And then, once they knew that there was no kind of foul play with his last whereabouts, they turned their attention to his employer, the Oldenburg Group. So they went to the HR department, and they said that he hadn't shown up for two weeks, which they kind of pretty much knew. When the chief, Laura Frizzo, asked if there was any close friends that he had that kind of he would talk to at work, they informed her that... Chris was rumored to be having this affair with Kelly Cochran. So when officers went to Kelly's home, her husband actually answered the door and he said Kelly wasn't home. But moments later, Kelly walks up right behind him. That's a burn. Sick burn. It's really (laughs) bad. That looks very bad. That's something out of a movie. Yeah. Great scene. It is. It is. So the officers, of course, are just like, why would he lie? And Kelly says that her husband was probably just kind of worried that she was in trouble, trying to protect her, that kind of stuff. Oh, you mean Kelly's talking for him? Right? Hmm. Yeah. Kelly confirmed that her and Chris were having an affair, but she said that Jason approved of it, that her husband was totally fine. They had basically this open arrangement. And while she said it, Jason's standing right there, and he had no reaction when he heard Kelly saying this to the officers. No, he was never like a jealous psychopath. He understood, you know, he couldn't really have sex with her so much because of the issue. He just couldn't do it. It was a physical thing, and she, he must have felt really bad. And Mm -hmm. at one point was just, you know, go for it, Kel. Right. And she went for it. Because there's a lot of people that were like, yeah, we fucked the shit out of each other for two months. And that's the thing is I think that if she just had like maybe, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't (laughs) rationalize it. But it's like if she had one side piece, maybe he would just be like, you know what? I understand. I can't physically do these things. You have a boyfriend and a husband, whatever. Or something. But the fact that she was kind of embarrassing him around town with all of these people, I think is one of the things that made it hurt so deeply. You know, it's one thing to be like, okay, I have this health issue. We have an arrangement. It's another thing to be like, oh my God, you're just running around with everybody and everybody knows that I'm married to you. So they're judging me for it. 
Yeah. I don't know. So the officers ask the couple basically to come in for questioning. And Kelly insists again that her and Jason have this open relationship and she was dating multiple men, but Jason was okay with it. Kelly explains that Jason, you know, had some ailments, he survived cancer, and he's not able to do these physical things. And that's why they had the arrangement where Kelly was able to see other people. When officers tell Kelly that Jason probably got jealous, she insisted that he knew how much she cared for Chris. And basically, Jason wouldn't hurt Chris because he knew it would hurt Kelly. That's the only reason. I, that... <laughs> Her way to explain that logic is just so flawed to me. Yeah. So, of course, they bring Jason in for questioning. And what happens is he just starts crying immediately. He's clearly distraught from the very first interview. He says basically he wasn't happy that Kelly was seeing other people, but he chose to accept it. And he explained that he was really grateful that Kelly had stayed with him through his health issues and the fact that he lost his job. And so he would kind of have understanding and put up with things because she had been there for him and not left him through those things. I believe this completely. I do believe that too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that he felt he owed her because she stayed. Yeah. You know? For she, sure. She was the one that was like, okay, sickness and health, I got you. We're going to do this. Therefore, now I've got to understand that you need to go out and be with dudes. Which is the opposite of its sickness and health. Uh, it's so... De- <laughs> but yeah, that's make- how... I think that's how he looked at it too. Just, you know, kind of... And I think it was probably, you know, you can have one or two. I'm so, we, right? One. Right. One is ideal, Kelly. One. But she got a little out of control. Yeah. And everyone fucking knew about it. Mm-hmm. And it was just all over the place. And- I just... I think that open relationships can work. You know what I mean? I think They that each so- have to know they're in one, though. Right. That some people can do this, but I think that it requires more communication than what they had. Yeah. And there were points, too, and where he honesty. was under the impression that she was going to just be with him again. Yes. So I just see a lot of, like, mind-fucking Jason. Right. That's the only fucking Jason. Oh, no. What we're doing. <laughs> sounds like i feel so bad for jason so jason explained in these interviews that he wouldn't harm anybody and basically said he was more suicidal than homicidal again in these interviews he's just clearly so sad and broken and he's just honest Mm -hmm. he's brutal yeah he is very transparent for sure When they interviewed Kelly's other lover, Eric Erickson. There he is. (laughs) He said that him and Kelly once had gotten together and they had gone to have sex in the same park and ride where Chris's car was found. Would that be the park and ride that she uh, wasn't aware of? Had no idea it was there. That's strange. No idea. Yeah. Kelly said she wasn't even aware that that park and ride was there. So Chief Rizzo knew Kelly had to be hiding something, but she theorized that it was most likely that Jason had snapped and that Kelly was covering it up. She'd done a really good job at this point of of like seeming relatively normal. Yes. And Jason, you know, she told them some crazy shit already about Jason. So I think they're just kind of going along with it. And just until they hear otherwise, they're going to assume she's honest. Kelly is telling us what we want to hear. Right. And I think they're... I, I don't know. I'm My opinion is I think they're kind of looking at it statistically, too. Like, it's more likely that the man got jealous and snapped True. in this situation than the woman being the killer. She surprised them all. Right. I think that they're kind of going off of just these assumed statistical yeah. kind of things. As winter came, Chief Laura Frizzo worried that basically the snow would keep them from finding Chris's body. So they were definitely racing against time. And again, they're in like a place where they have to worry about snow covering bodies. Yes. I and mean, that's cold as shit. Yes. Barbecues outside? Perfect time to move. That's all I'm thinking. <laughs> Ideal. When shit gets wet, put a box down and there's snow. Oh, Destroyed. God. What's the point of this? What are we're we doing just, here? We're such spoiled LA people. Like, I can't even imagine being in snow right now. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's so hot. I want it to be cold. It's like 70. I'm like, I need a jacket. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's getting cold. In March 2015, they searched the Cochran's home. 
and officers did not find really any immediate obvious signs of murder. But they did find what could have been blood spatter on the ceiling. The problem was that it had been painted over, so they really couldn't confirm if it was human blood or confirm that it was Chris's without further testing. But during the search, they did seize a bunch of guns, a ton of knives. Basically, they had a whole arsenal of weapons. And they also got their cell phones and their computers to look into. The immediate triumph of the search was that investigators were able to see how Jason and Kelly were clearly terrified by the search warrant. So they knew that they were basically on the right track by their reaction. These two were pretty transparent in that sense. Mm -hmm. When they were nervous, it showed. And they talk about Jason turning bright red a lot. Yeah. And like, that that sucks. I know. You can't keep a secret for shit (laughs) if you're turning bright red all the time. No, I relate. High blood pressure. (laughs) Poor guy. Anxiety like a motherfucker. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really the telltale sign of like, oh, yeah, these are the people that we need to be looking more into. Which was good, you know what I mean? Because then they knew they were on the right track and they could keep looking into it. They knew right away they didn't have to expand their search, basically. Not at all. So Kelly and Jason went to the neighbor's house while their home was being searched. And the neighbors confirmed that Jason and Kelly really were acting more strangely than they had ever seen before. Kelly basically couldn't stop talking. She just turned into complete motor mouth and kept saying... Do you think they could find anything? Did you do a good job of cleaning up? And again, like you said, Jason turned bright red and he was clearly really nervous. He was quiet the same as always, but they could tell something was different. Can you imagine being those neighbors? I know. Knock on the door. Hey, our house is being searched by the cops. Can we come sit here with you guys? Hey, we might we be murderers, we but hey, don't know we have some lemonade or something Yeah, for the next 12 hours? <laughs> I mean, can you even imagine? No. And they already know. They're just like, yeah, you did something. All well, that construction, yeah. the fires, we know that you did it. You fed us people. Right? <laughs> I mean, David over here has lost 30 fucking pounds yeah. in a week. Like, yeah, David's in the corner just like, yeah, sure, come in. Are you thirsty? Right? I can't even imagine. (laughs) No. But the thing is, the next morning, the Cochran's were gone. So the search warrant just scared them right out of town. They were so spooked that they just left almost everything behind and suddenly moved to Maryville, Indiana. They actually left so quickly that they even left a bunch of weed that they had planted. Now, I thought about this, too, that like if they were mid-teen plants or older, close to harvest, that sucks. Like, oh, that's lost. But if they're younger than that, you can rebuild very cheaply. <laughs> you know, so it's right. like it's not that huge of a cost loss. Of yeah. This loss. We'll take it, <laughs> it you know, because that sucks regardless. But put yeah, a lot of energy into shit. That's but sad. still, it's just like they left. They bounced. Yeah, so quickly. No question. Yep. A couple weeks after the search warrant, the results from the blood spatter test came back. And the blood was found to be human. But it was not confirmed to belong to Chris. This is when the neighbors come running over. Right. They're like, mm, hey, there let me this, tell you about this lobster. This week that everything was real loud. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So they tracked Kelly and Jason back to Indiana, and they were staying with her mother. So they served warrants to obtain their DNA and bring them in for further questioning. But Jason really immediately lawyered up. Once they got his DNA, then it was Kelly's turn to be questioned. And Chief Rizzo says that she already knew what happened, and it was basically time for Kelly to come clean. So she confronts Kelly with text messages and the interview confirming that she'd basically lied about knowing about the park and ride where Chris's car was found. Through those interviews, Chief Rizzo basically deduced that Kelly seemed to be the controlling kind of alpha figure in their relationship, even though she painted Jason out to be a monster. 
This is interesting that you have an alpha that is smart enough to know that if they're the alpha, they won't get away with shit. Right. And they're very like a planner. So they have to pretend to be a beta to do their alpha scheming. Mm-hmm. And they're using their good for evil. Yeah. Because Kelly sounds like somebody who really could like organize some shit, do some stuff and get people to do things for her. Yes. Big time. Yeah. She's definitely a leader. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's just bizarre as hell. But she, Jason was perfect mm-hmm. for her. He was the mark. The perfect mark. Yeah. It's a long con. It really is. Neighbors and childhood. Right? <laughs> so with the DNA test pending and no confession, Chief Rizzo proceeds with searching the local wooded areas and bodies of water. So they're dragging every lake, every river, going through every field. After all that, they found a barrel that seemed to be used in that fire that the neighbors smelled. And it had this cement block attached with a clothesline. The neighbors would go on to identify that the clothesline attached to the center block was in Jason and Kelly's yard. They also find this burn pit in the front yard that had a zipper and buttons and a saw blade in it. Confirms the neighbor's story. (laughs) Yeah. But nothing collected from the fires or the spatter from the home or anywhere else really linked Jason and Kelly to Chris's murder. It just all was fishy, but there was no direct DNA. But they did find this rabbit's foot keychain that belonged to Chris that was on the ground outside of the Cochran's house. Without the DNA connection or anything, the investigation kind of went quiet and Chief Laura Frizzo worried that it would continue to be only a missing persons case and there would be no progress made. So a full 16 months passed by after Chris went missing a long time where just nobody knows anything and on february 20th 2016 paramedics responded to a 911 call from kelly saying that her husband jason was unresponsive i would bet every day that chief rizzo comes in she's like is today the day i'm gonna get the phone call about kelly cochran's next crime right they're just waiting for her to fuck up yeah unless someone brings them something they're probably not gonna find anything They know who it is and they have nothing linking. And they just have to wait for something else to happen. Yeah. So on the call, Kelly says, quote, I don't know what's wrong. He's blue. He's throwing up. He's sweating. I need an ambulance right away. So the medics arrived to find Jason with no pulse and there were needles nearby, which basically implied that he had a drug overdose. EMTs say that Kelly was disruptive and kept interrupting and blocking them, physically blocking them, when they were trying to bring Jason back to life, basically. She was so disruptive while they were trying to revive him that the paramedics eventually made her completely leave the room entirely. After he passed, Kelly organized a memorial for Jason and said on Facebook that his death was the hardest thing she had ever had to deal with. Who's she going to have do all her shit now? Who's her little henchman that she Mourning can order around? Mourning the death of her footman. Right. It's just so sad. His autopsy revealed that although there was indeed heroin in Jason's system, he had actually died of asphyxiation. He had hemorrhaging and bruising and collapsed sinus cavities, suggesting that there was pressure on his face when he died. So Jason's death was ruled to be a homicide. And Kelly's there. The only one there. Surprise. Detectives believe that Kelly gave her husband this fatal overdose of heroin and then afterwards choked him or smothered him until he died. It's kind of the only thing that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. They theorized that Kelly had either wanted to keep him quiet or resented him for killing her boyfriend. Either way. I do wonder about the motivation to kill Jason. Yeah. He maybe was going to talk. Maybe he had already, like, said things that made her nervous. Mm -hmm. And it was just, like, a matter of time. Yeah. 
and enough time had gone by. Maybe this was it. Yeah. I think there must have been a couple and conversations course, that were tense. I've gotten away with one. <laughs> so what's stopping me? It's stopping me this time. Yep. In interrogation, Kelly told the local detective, Jeremy Ogden, that the injuries probably occurred because she had slapped his face a few times to wake him up while he was ODing. Now, I personally, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. When I saw that, I was like, that's a good fucking argument, girl. It's a good excuse. I know. Yeah. Because panic. Yeah. I mean, you fucking panic. Like, nothing else. When, yeah. you know, you're in, confronted with, like, that life and death shit. Beat the shit out of someone to revive them. Yeah, wake up, wake Anything up. Anything it takes. Mm-hmm. Fucking chipping teeth, whatever the fuck has to happen, wake them up. Right. I mean, that's a good one. Mm-hmm. To explain that away. Now, the hemorrhaging and the strangulation. It's a little bit too that much. That is going to be difficult. But the broken nose and shit? Oh, yeah, we can explain that away. Right. Swollen eyes, all of it. It makes perfect sense, More, but it's too maybe far. Not punching him in the face, like in the eyes, but... Trying to revive someone. Yeah, just kind of sure. hitting his cheek a little bit makes sense. Kelly's an intense person. <laughs> so. Kelly goes over the top. Kelly, we know that. We already Doesn't know, know that. the limits. So maybe break she a couple. Broke his nose. Yeah. But of course, from the interviews, if you're talking to this person, you can kind of see whether this is truthful or not. And Jeremy Ogden, the detective, felt like Kelly would not come clean on her own. That she had more involvement than she was letting on, and she just kind of needed. Someone to pull it out of her. Detective Ogden made a plan with one of Jason's friends, Walt Amerman, to record a phone call with Kelly. Walt was supposed to tell Kelly that Jason had sent him a letter recently with another letter inside addressed to the police. This is a pretty beautifully constructed ruse. It's perfect. It's really good. It's really good. And I like Detective Ogden from the second I saw him. Yeah. I don't even know why. I just, I like that guy. Like, I, yeah, like, I trust this guy. You know what? I'm going to see where this goes with him because I also felt like I could see somebody that he could be the one to pull this shit out of her. Yes. She liked him too. It seemed like she did. They got along really well. Yeah. Said, so, I mean, they met constantly. Mm-hmm. She yeah, she seemed to, to be more talkative with him than anyone else. She, I think that's it. Yeah. Chief Frizzo, as a woman, might have been a little more of like an adversary to her. Like, I got to be smarter than this bitch. I got to get out of this. Yeah. Ogden came to her like, I just want to know what happened. Right. Jason sucks. I just want to know the truth. You tell we me gotta all about this it. Out. How yeah. did he hurt you? Mm-hmm. She just took that shit. And she's like, that's what I need to hear for this lie. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, so... Kelly hears that there's this letter that's going to be addressed to the police. And Walt told Kelly that Jason instructed him to send the letter if anything bad happened to him. So Kelly, of course, is going into freak out mode when she hears this. And she immediately tells Walt on the phone call, please don't. Then she pleads with him not to send the letter. So Detective Ogden's plan... She played right into it, basically. A hundred percent. Yeah. And you can hear just the, like, record scratch. Error, error. <laughs> yeah. When you're listening to that call. Please don't. Yeah. It's great. Please don't. Yeah. It's bad. <laughs> Shortly after, Kelly asked Walt if he already mailed the letter, and he said he already had. It was too late. Kelly asked him what was in the letter, And Walt told her that he didn't open it. He had no idea. So after hanging up with Walt, Kelly called Detective Ogden and starts to inquire about the letter. She thinks it's probably already there, right? I just feel like if you've seen one episode of Dateline, you you don't just go like, all right, Walt, click. Detective Ogden? Right. (laughs) That's not the first phone call, right? You know that's how it's instantaneous, right? But I, I don't know. I just... What the fuck are you doing? You know somebody is fucking with you right now. Right. Someone's fucking your shit up from above. This is <laughs> way bigger than you. I don't know. I just feel hours and hours of crime TV. Never going to make that mistake. Right. I would I'm never, never fall for that situation. trap. Let me clarify that. <laughs> I'm never going to have to do that. But it ain't happening. Yeah. Mm-mm. You just see right through that ruse. 
You're going to have to for sure. dig deeper for that. <laughs> so, of course, Kelly is ready to talk at this point that she knows the letter's there. And she suddenly flips everything that she said about Jason before in her interrogations. She tells them how she was abused and afraid of Jason and he was a violent man. And Kelly claims that Jason caught her and Chris having sex. And that's why Jason killed Chris. You mean when I just have this vision of her having him against the wall? Right. Just give me that shit now. Yeah. I'll fuck the shit out of you against this wall. <laughs> like, she's a controlling chick. She's kind of scary. That, that, when you see <laughs> like, the testimony, you'll, honestly, you'll have the visual of her just fucking, give me those hands. Right. <laughs> like, up against a wall, you know? Like, I don't Hold know. I do not believe that they had sex in the entryway no. at all. I don't buy that story. But when I let myself go there, it's an interesting visual. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> so Detective Ogden pleads with Kelly to help him find Chris's remains so that his children can bury him and they can have some peace. Oh, I'm such a sympathetic person towards his children. Right. Since I fucking cut him up with a bunch of tools I'd probably try to return later. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> but Kelly, I mean, she she went with it. She led detectives to the remote trail where they had dumped the body parts. And while the search teams canvassed the area, Kelly agreed to go back to the old house and do a reenactment. So this is where Kelly told, tells the story of how they were having sex in the entryway and she didn't know that Jason was home, but suddenly he appeared downstairs in the basement and he shot upwards from the basement and hit Chris in the head, at which point he fell backwards down the stairs and then that's where Jason dismembered Chris in the basement. That's how she paints it in the reenactment. And it covers all the bases she needs to. Mm -hmm. What happened with he was at the top of the stairs, he was at the bottom of the stairs. Right. Uh, who shot him from where? Because it doesn't make sense if he goes this way or if he doesn't. Oh, well, you were having sex against this wall here, so that's how he fell. Like, none of it makes sense, but she is just ticking off boxes yeah. of the lies she's told. And again, like, she's trying, but they're just not going to... It's not going to track, girl. Right. Nice it's trial. forensics. I appreciate the... Now, oh my God, you just reminded me. Sorry. She minored in college in forensics. Shut up. I didn't know that. Major in psychology. Shut so, up. as you will see later, this bitch gets ballsy and she's like, well, what does your evidence have to say about that? What's your forensics test? And tries to like pull this shit <gasps> out and use it on the detectives. And they're like, she's fucking nuts like even more than normal because she's trying to play law and order yeah CSI. i didn't know about all that oh yeah caught that today wow oh yeah good shit right that's crazy yeah i loved that <laughs> that I mean, is it, an it interesting also made detail more sense to me of why there's certain lies that she really goes to town on and a right. lot of them are scientific yeah she like, knows it has measure. to add up exactly yeah very interesting hmm so, of course, at this point, she knows they also don't have enough to arrest her. But they know all they need to do is basically find the forensics to confirm what they already know, that she was involved. So they let her go and they make an appointment to continue talking the next day. But when the next day comes and Kelly's supposed to show up, Detective Ogden receives a text from her saying, quote, the West Coast looks good at this time of day. She really wants Stop to, it. like, throw him on the trail of, you know, like, she envisions him in the airport getting on the plane to L.A. Like, oh, she's there. I'm falling for this. I feel like this detective took the place of the emotional affair of these boyfriends. Yeah. Because the way that she, like, throws these things out, it's like, you know, breadcrumbs and see what he'll... And they met over 40 times, they said. Mm -hmm. And her story was different every time. Yeah. But he would just sit there and listen to her for hours. And that, I think, she took his attention and misinterpreted as, like, he is into me. Yeah. Maybe if I just give it 10 months, we'll be together. <laughs> Who knows what the fuck she thought. But yeah, she kept stringing she him along, him though. Like she did in other people. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, they know that she's fleeing and they get an arrest warrant. And he keeps texting her in order to find her through the pings on her phone. 
So they catch up with her in Kentucky, not the West Coast, and she's arrested by the marshals. She finally admits that not only was she involved in the plan to kill Chris, but she was actually supposed to do the murder herself. She tells the detectives about her and Jason's pact from way back when they first got married, that either of them, if they had an affair, they would have to kill their lover. Convenient. But Kelly's feelings for Chris were too strong, and she couldn't go through with the murder, so she just agreed to basically lure him in so that Jason could kill him. But she doesn't want to do this. She repeatedly says, well, I didn't want to do this, but I made this pact with Jason. And I had to. You make your own decisions, people! Right. Like, she was involved in making the pact in the first place. I would Shaking never make head. a pact like that. Uh, you're either a murderer or you're not a murderer. Okay, you know? and it's my wedding night. And right? Like, like, Sign this shit right now. Like, I thought I knew you for the last however many years of being your neighbor. Right. But who the fuck is this guy? Now you're just upping the romance. I thought you were this chill guy that looks like Butterbean. Oh my God. <laughs> so Kelly agrees to go out into the woods with them to help narrow down the search for Chris's remains. And she loves every fucking second she of it. She loves it. She loves it. Smoking, chain smoking mm -hmm. on the fucking gravel drives and everything. Just loving it. She's all about the attention. She all needs it. it. The, what Jason's family said from the beginning about her needing to be the center of attention becomes really clear. Oh, it's all Kelly all the time. Yes. Absolutely. Poor Jason. And you know, when he says that he was suicidal, not homicide, I believe that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Oh. So as they're waiting on the side of the road for the dogs to find human remains, Kelly's sitting there chain smoking, like you said, and she admits that she initially got sick when she cr saw Chris being dismembered. But after that kind of first wave of shock, she actually enjoyed seeing the blood. Shock value. Yes. I really think this is for a reaction. It kind of, okay, again, it's like, it reminds me a little bit of like in the West Memphis Three when they're saying the most insane shit just for people to get a reaction. Yeah. And then their words are held against them and they're like, oh, I shouldn't have fucking said that. Right. Like, oops. I kind of feel like Kelly lets it get away from her for a minute. Yeah. She loses she's the like, plot for She's sure. just lying and telling stories and then she's just like, and I licked the blood and I loved it. And she's like, oh, I fucking said that out loud. Yeah. And maybe she did. I don't know what Which to is believe. even weirder. I know. Yeah. She said she got like this high from it and she admitted that she liked the taste of his blood. Which is way more than someone who made a pact with her boyfriend mm -hmm. or husband to just kill him because and he then would it just kill him and be done. Got out of control is the way she kind of yeah. spins it. No, she's drinking his but blood. Then all of a sudden she's, she's a vampire. To, she's right, held her skelter on doors. Right. Like she's fucking Manson at this point because she's been controlling Jason right. from afar. Right. So now she's going to lick up blood. It's so, she's so nuts. This is crazy. She's all over the place. All over. So. While she's, you know, on the side of the road making this confession, the dogs start finding bones. And eventually, when they test it, it's determined to belong to Chris Regan. So Kelly also takes the detectives to the lake where the gun was tossed, and the dive team ends up recovering the gun. This is like an afterthought, too. Yeah. Just, oh, do you want to know where the gun's at? Yeah, she's just... Uh, giving it all what? up. Yeah. Um, while That's you're a good just idea. Talking, yeah. Where's the gun at? I'll take <laughs> you. It's fucking there. Right. And back at the Cochrane home, Kelly points out the forceps that she used to try and retrieve the bullet from Chris's skull. And the forceps are tested and they're found to have Chris's blood. Which is so strange because that story is one that is so hard to believe. Mm. Oh, he handed me this and he said, take the bullet. And, and, but then there's blood on it. So then it matches something. Up. Something's true. So it's just like, fuck this bitch. Yeah. You have, it's like certain parts of it could be true. And this is the problem. Right. But I you still just, think she's just a fucking liar. You don't know what to believe in this whole I'm story. I'm sure. I, I believe that Jason used the forceps and they have blood on them. And then she just tells this whole fucking story hmm. about her doing it. I do believe probably used it. He dismembered the man. Right. Anyway, <laughs> detectives say that throughout their questioning and the reenactments with Kelly, she frequently asked if there was a diagnosis 
for the kind of detachment that she had. This is interesting that she's searching for a cure because she knows something's wrong with her. Yeah, she says she was born this way. She doesn't have a feeling and she doesn't experience like sadness or remorse or sorrow. And she's really trying to get answers. I kind of believe it because you watch her like express herself and it's very just... Mm -hmm. Duh. Like yeah. one tone. It's just closed off. Yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. yeah, closed. Yeah. So Kelly is charged with Chris's murder and says that she planned to defend herself. But eventually she agrees to use a public defender. Anyone that's just down to defend themselves, I immediately am questioning your sanity. Oh, yeah. Instant. And you're not going to come across well. <laughs> if you believe that you will, you won't. Right. So opening statements for the Kelly Cochran trial began on Valentine's Day 2017 in Crystal Falls, Michigan. And Kelly's defense strategy was to say that she didn't have a choice whether to participate in the murder because she was afraid that Jason would kill her if she didn't do what he said. But the jury didn't buy it and she was found guilty on all counts in May of 2017. And she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So in addition to Chris's murder, Kelly was also separately charged with the murder of her husband, Jason. And she actually decided to make a plea deal for this murder in April of 2018. In the plea, she admitted to injecting her husband with heroin and then smothering him out of revenge for him killing her boyfriend, Chris. So it seems like she starts to at least get a little bit more truthful. I don't believe the motive, but I believe now what she's telling us. Yeah. The fact that she admits that, like, I went, I fucking got some heroin, and I injected his ass up, and then I smothered him. Right. But I did it because, I, you know what I mean? I believe the action. I don't believe the motive. Yeah. But that's Kelly. Yeah. She told her in-laws and her own parents that she hoped they could forgive her for the pain that she caused them. Kelly became emotional and she teared up when she read the following statement in court. I won't read it in its entirety, but here's a few excerpts. She said, there are a lot of heavy hearts in this room, including mine. I've never stopped loving him. After Jason died, my world crumbled around me. I take full responsibility for Jason's death. If I could take it back, I would. I love you all, and I hope nothing but the best for you. I will die in prison. I have accepted that fate. I would fucking lose it on this bitch right here. I know. Because I have a visual of her sort of like legally blonde. <laughs> Shut going up and just like having your hands together and addressing them like, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> like with this super bullshit attitude of like, you know, because she's accepted it. She's going to prison. Right. So she's fine with it. Don't fucking worry. You should have acceptance too because I murdered his ass. I killed this motherfucker. You know, maybe not exactly like that, but yeah. I would be fucking pissed. There are a lot of heavy hearts in the room. Well, including mine. She's a self-centered brat mm -hmm. who's gotten away with everything. And so she'll until continue to lie until yes. to just kind of alleviate any sort of guilt. Yep. Even if it's overall guilty and there's a little bit she can get away with, she wants that little piece. Yeah. So, of course, Jason's parents said that Kelly is evil and they will never forgive her. 34-year-old Kelly Cochran was sentenced to 65 years to be served consecutive to the life sentence for Chris Regan's murder. Part of Kelly's plea was that she's not to be charged with any other crimes in Lake County. And detectives hope that if Kelly's harmed anybody else, she'll be more likely to be honest about it because she won't be afraid that she'll be charged with more crimes. I, I, I believe that about the motivation for that. Yeah. No, they oh, believe that... she's done more. For sure, the detectives think that there's other things they could charge her with, but they know she's going to be in there for life. So if we agree not to charge her with anything else, then we can close these other cases, get some answers for some other families, and she could just be honest. Kelly's going to get bored in there. Yeah. She'll she just, start she's coming a out with crimes. She's a storyteller, and it's just a matter of time. And when she wants attention again... 
she'll just be like, well, there's this body Mm -hmm. here. And like, they'll DNA test it. Maybe it's true. That would be pretty unreal. Yeah. But she wants to keep her name in the news. I don't think this will be the last we hear of her. I don't either. I don't know if it's like as many as she says, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's like one, maybe two other people around. Right. Just with the, the callousness of this bitch. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So like we talked about, the Dead North documentary was made about this case, and it included interviews with friends and family who suspect that Cochran has committed as many as nine other murders. And they think that she basically buried these victims across the Midwest. She would just talk about this. Yeah. Very open about it. A recorded. (laughs) But no one knew. Right. (laughs) Sorry. It's all a big secret. No one had a clue how cold and callous she was. But she said she had bodies all over the fucking state. Like, just crazy. Yeah. It's not a secret. We can tell by looking at her. Yeah. (laughs) So a recorded call between Kelly and her mother details how she's always been like this as far back as she can remember. And Kelly's mom says that she wishes Kelly would have asked her for help, but Kelly says she tried and there's no help. She seems kind of shocked that her mother didn't see this coming, as well as I kind of do. Okay, I don't, it's weird. I kind of like, because the mom is just pleading with her, tell me when. Tell me what when did it happen? Tell me what anything. Was the thing? Yeah. And Kelly's just it's always been this way. Again, totally shut off. Just shut off cold shit. And just I'm shocked you didn't notice. Mm-hmm. Which is so scary for every parent. Right? How because you think there's gonna be a sign. Yeah. Something, a red flag. I'm sure there were. Yeah. In the documentary, she says that she has 14 butterfly tattoos, and there's one for each person that she's lost. And, of course, the chief, Laura Frizzo, believes that these tattoos actually represent her victims, not just people she cared about. I don't know. We'll see. Kelly's brother, Colton Gaboyan, came forward to inform police that he believes there's nine additional victims. But he had no information as to who they might be. Colton says a guy Kelly was talking to on Facebook disappeared. And he also heard Jason and Kelly talking about nine others before anything happened with Chris. On a couple occasions, Kelly herself even claimed to have killed as many as 21 people. But officers believe this is probably an exaggeration, and Kelly's, of course, like we said, known to have lied to police before, so it's hard to know what to believe. I think it's really interesting that her brother is the one that's putting this on her, because it makes me wonder if he doesn't have Kelly syndrome too. Yeah, if he's just got this fantastical imagination where he's yeah. like, my sister's a murderer. Yeah, and yeah. like he probably gets a lot of ass in these down-home little <laughs> bars. For being, I mean, it's stupid as fuck, but like this brother of a murderer, He's there's some girl there. Small town famous. So what's your name? Right. You know, like I heard about well, you. Well, my last name's Cochran. Some so. shit, some shit like that, mm-hmm. right? So I think it's kind of interesting. But yeah. at the, I mean, I don't know. I don't doubt that there might be other people. I don't think there's nine. Yeah, that's a lot. On a recorded phone call, Kelly admits to Detective Jeremy Ogden that there are other bodies in Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee, and Minnesota. However, she doesn't really volunteer any information about their identities or specific locations of these bodies. She's just trying to kind of be provocative, I think. She wants to be Mrs. Jeremy Ogden (laughs) and needs a reason to call him every, you know, couple years I know hearings. right just like check in and yeah just tell to you see about if his feelings victim. have changed right be willing to come visit her yeah but one of the cool things about this story is that after the case the chief Laura Frizzo and detective Jeremy Ogden fell in love and they believe that they're destined to be together it's kind of cute this is the greatest love story ever told. It's really And crazy. it's so weird that it comes from Kelly Cochran. Right, right. Who's just this murderous, adulterous, like, cold-hearted snake. Right. A hundred percent. That led to this love story. And there She was the matchmaker. As can be. And yeah. she was also the one, she was removed 
from being the chief while investigating this case because yeah. there was a conflict of interest, whatever. There, was, I think it was a governor. Or something. Somebody higher up, there was some sort of audit on their department, and this was the excuse they used to get her out. So she finished this not as the chief. Right. She was like just a lay person or some shit. And then... Starts dating up Detective Jeremy Ogden, which I'm sure Kelly's losing her fucking mind I over know. every five seconds. Yeah. But I love it. Yeah. Laura says that she wasn't meant to find Chris Regan's remains until she found Jeremy, the love of her life, first. Oh, that's gross. It's like grossly romantic. So adorable. True crime romance. But see, it can happen. Yeah. You can find love. It's cute, it's but it's also situation. horrific. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's so, but that's Kelly. The, that's the only bright spot of yeah. that whole yeah. thing because the whole story is just there's so much. I feel like we still don't know. There's I assume we there's even cover. more people. Yes, not as many as nine or twenty one, but I don't think that these are the only two people that Kelly murdered. Chris Regan wasn't the first boyfriend at Oldenburg, right? So, I mean, they so we probably know. all have stories, too. Mm -hmm. And you know she's told fantastical shit her whole life. So, like, one person, she tells them she's adopted, and she's, like, the child of Italian royalty. <laughs> right. And then it's the parent trap with over here, right? <laughs> and then it's this one with this one. And so if you really start putting this shit together, like, I'm sure it's wonderful. Right. And I would bet money that there is some sort of book deal slash mm. option Maybe a Lifetime movie. No, it's going to be Oxygen because Oxygen now is all crime. Right. There's going to be a movie about these two. Yeah. There's going to be something for sure. There's got to be. It's just, it's it's made for this shit. This it's is what such it's a for. crazy This is why story. we watch this shit. But she is pretty fucking bad bitch. Like, I was really liking Chief Laura Rizzo. Yeah. And she knew Kelly was from, she had her number from day one. And she was so emotionally invested in the case. Like, she was... The perfect balance of heart and just hard work. And you know what I mean? Like she was dedicated and serious, but she was also not cold. She was very attached to his family, his son. You know, I think that she really was just really cared about what happened to Chris. And she also like her and Terry at the beginning when he was just a missing person. Mm. They just clicked. And I think that really helped too. Yeah. And then she also... Um, like her and Detective Ogden, they just clicked. Obviously, there was way more going on, but like, thank God, because this could have been really like swept under. Like when yeah. they when they just kind of took off and there was really nothing, there was blood, but you know what? Anybody else that was like, we got a caseload, sweep it. It was a missing person. Like, it's not like they had a body. It could have slipped through the yeah. cracks so easily. She was affected. Someone could have just said, hey, it's the middle of nowhere in the middle of winter. Fuck it. You know, yeah. they're just missing. That's the end of it. I but she really was dedicated to figuring out what happened. She knew something was hinky yeah. with Kelly Cochran. Yeah. She knew. She just had to wait it out. Mm -hmm. Like she just, you know, she tried to do everything she could. And then when she couldn't, now I just got to give it time because this girl will fuck up again. Yes. And then it's she'll lie about it. Time. So. Yeah. And that's pretty much the end of letter A. This is the last letter A episode. This is the end. I, the last adultery story we have. That's true. I have a feeling we're going to be covering this lady again. We're going to, we haven't seen the we're end. We're going to have to do a bonus case update episode. Definitely. Because there's, this is not the end we've heard of Kelly. No, Cochran. not the last we've heard of this chick. For sure. So I think that's pretty much it. If you want to follow us on social media, check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The links are in the show notes. If you want to join our Patreon or go on our thread list to get shirts, phone cases, all that stuff, those links are in the show notes as well. And definitely we recommend that documentary, Dead North. Dead North. The on link the is going to be in there. ID Go app. Yep. Investigation Discovery. <laughs> so I think that's it. We'll see you next week. All right. See ya. Bye.
The Starlight Lounge presents An Evening with the Progressive Box. Old moon, yeah. That's Hugo, tickling the ivories. He just saved by bundling home and auto with Progressive. Gonna finally buy a ring for that gal of yours, Hugo? Send her my condolences. hi oh This next one's for you, too. There's a burglar in my heart. Thank you. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Discounts not available in all states or situations. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.